Let's give Willie a hand as she comes on up. I will let you officially introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, I'm Lily Marie, and I'm the writer, director, one of the producers. And I just wanted to thank the cast and crew who came out. Yeah. Um, we've got two producers, Alice Vaughn. If you'll stand up, let people oh. applaud for you. Alice Vaughn and Boney James, who is also the composer on the film. We've got the fantastic Nico Villavongs, who taught me what a production designer does. Mm -hmm. And she was immensely, she was a huge part of the look of this movie. Stand up. <laughs> um, and then we've got some amazing cast. We've got Ellen Crawford, is she still here? Yeah. Ellen, oh. Ellen Crawford, Takayo Fisher. Chris Tashima. who's starring in a brand new film called Under the Blood Red Sun, and he was one of my endorsers to join the Directors Guild of America. <laughs> because he won an Academy Award for his uh, short film. These is in virtue. Uh, we've got Robert Bailey Jr. Played JJ, and he's one of the stars of NBC's The Night Shift now. And, uh, and of course, we've got the fantastic Nicole Bloom, yeah. who uh, was on Shameless, and now she's starring in her own series. Uh, it's, a, it's about to air. It's called Superstore. When's it air? Uh, 30th. The 30th. <laughs> all right. And I'm going to take full credit for all the success they've had since this movie. <laughs> Nice. Welcome, everyone. Um, just for those watching and for those in the audience, um, a big reason we do these independent films is for our audience of actors to learn um, how to create their own work from people that's been there, done that, and survived uh, to tell about it. So, um, so we're going to get started with um, story and script because without that, you can't do everything else. Right. So let's talk about how this story for you came to be and where did it come from? Um, let's see. Well, uh, the f first incarnation of the script was called More Than This, and I wrote it eight years ago, uh, or I, actually, yes, eight years ago. Um, I wrote it and submitted it to the Sundance Feature Film Labs, and I made it to the second round of application, and then I didn't get in. So then I rewrote it, and I changed the title to Model Minority, and I uh, submitted it a couple years later, and I got to the second round in the application process, and I didn't get in. So at that point, I was uh, invited to um, uh, an emerging or uh, independent Asian American filmmakers conference. And there were like 30 of us. And Chris was one of the speakers. Um, and uh, I sat in this room with like really talented, successful filmmakers, Asian American filmmakers. and. The best thing about being there with them was that I started going around the room, and we were learning a lot, you know, in, in the process of all these seminars and stuff. But I started going around the room and asking everybody, "How much did you spend on your feature?" And they'd say, "A hundred thousand dollars," you know, two hundred thousand dollars. And I thought, "Wow, it's possible. I, I wonder if it's possible to do that with model minority." So at that point, I had raised about $40,000. And I thought, OK, you know, uh, I think people were hesitant to give me money because I hadn't started production. You know, didn't want to just hand me some money and nothing was going on. So I just took a leap of faith. And for about six months, I started assembling my team and working on the script. I contacted a friend of mine who's a really brilliant director, his name is Matt Casella. And I, I handed him the script and I said, would you read this as a director? Just treat me like I'm the writer and you're gonna direct this. What notes would you give me as the writer? And he took me through a couple of incarnations, a couple of drafts, and made it 
ready to shoot. And that was probably the most invaluable thing or the most valuable thing that um, that happened with the script. Um, Can you I, talk about maybe one or two of those things that, that came out for you in that conversation? Um, he just helped me, you know, the, there was some overwriting and he felt like there were scenes where you, you know, he was saying, you just show it. You don't have to, you don't have to explain. When you're reading it, sometimes it's like a book, you know, you think you have to explain everything. But when you're looking at it on screen, if, if your characters are actually doing the thing, they don't have to talk about it while they're doing it. And he helped me sort through all that. Um, he also helped me sort through things that I knew about the character and assumed that you knew about the character, but, you know, he'd say, okay, you know this, but I don't know this, so you need to tell me. So there were times where I would have to do exposition to tell the story of what was happening. Um, the other person that was really valuable was um, my friend from ER, Eric LaSalle, who, um, gave me a lot as a you know he's directing now as well so he gave me a lot of those sort of notes where for instance um there he suggested a scene which ended up in the movie of uh kayla and uh Treshawn driving past the museum and seeing jj standing there and jj sees them and he said this puts an uh, uh, this ends JJ's story, but it also puts a really nice button on the fact that she told him that the reason she couldn't date him was because he was black, and then she sees him. He sees her in a car with a, a young man who's black. So he, it's like this, these layers of betrayal and guilt on her part, and. And just it just added a really nice fabric to the story. So it was notes like that, notes that that were dramatic um, and visual rather than just exposition. And about how long? Because you said she raised some money, but then how long kind of was the script writing process up to this conference and kind of then past this conference? About how long did were you um, in that writing so process? That was like f four years, I guess. Yeah. And so then through the conference, you realize, okay, you can kind of take the next steps to realizing that, okay, maybe we can slowly move in the pre-production and, and kind of get the ball rolling. Right. right. Great. Um, and then in this note-taking process, when did you go, okay, this is a time to really kind of like, okay, the script is ready enough to really kind of take it to the next level? Was it after your meetings with, with Eric and, and the other gentleman? Yes, exactly. And some of that rewriting was actually going on during the pre-production process. So then what was um, what was building your producer team like? Who did you, did you already know who you wanted? Was there people on board or did you start making um, asks out to certain people? Kind of talk about how you built kind of the production team. Um, I just started looking around at people I knew. Um, you know, I, I, I had to write an essay to join the DGA. <laughs> and uh, in the essay, I'm supposed to talk about what what experience led me to make the production or to to uh i forget what the the wording is but it's something about what experience was the most beneficial toward your being a member of the dga and i had to say it was my being on er you know i i um i was on the show for the first couple of years and you know, we had 16-hour days at one point, and we were just like sitting around for long periods of time. And I noticed one of the other actors, Deezer D, dressed in street clothes with headphones on, sitting behind Video Village. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm, I'm shadowing the director. I said, what's that? And he said, I'm learning how to direct television. And I said, well, I'm sitting here all day. I want to do that too. <laughs> So I asked John Wells and Chris Chulak, our producers, if I could shadow someone, and they asked Leslie Linka Gladder, who's now the queen of of HBO. She's the executive, one of the executive producers on Homeland. Um, 
if I could shadow her. And that really was the reason I became a director. She, you know, because I was a cast member, they opened up everything for me. I could go to concept meetings and, you know, all the production meetings and location scouts. And I was invited in a, in a way that, because I've shadowed lots of other shows, but I was invited to shadow in a way that I, I've never done on any other show because I was already part of the family. And um, uh, so that, I mean, that, that was really the reason I became a director. And, and the first short film I did, I got a lot of the cast and crew to help me on that. And so when I was ready to do this, I sort of went back to my, I mean, we were together for 15 seasons. So I went back to them and said, you know, several of them and asked them if they would help me. And they all, all said yes. So um, uh, Eric LaSalle recommended someone. Uh, one of our post, one of our other producers helped me, helped me with post, Wendy uh, Rosado. Um, and then my husband, you know, I got to a certain point and I thought, who's been here from the beginning? Who read every draft of this film? Who gave me notes on every draft of this film? Who looked at the casting tapes with me? Who, who, you know, who, who did the music? Who, who looked at every, every cut of the film with me? And that was my husband. So at that point it was like, he had to be. <laughs> that out, yeah. He had to be one of the producers too. Um, and then I reached out to my best friend, and and she became one of the producers as well. So you know, I just tapped into people I trusted, who had experience, and I knew who were talented. I mean, really, it's because it's an. And then I I had to because it's an independent film. I had to be one of the producers as well. So you really just have to get people who are going to be in it for the, the love of your project and for the long haul. Um, you know, because when you're making an independent film, it really is all about the, the long haul. Um, it sounds like to me from hearing your story that this time through learning through ER and the time it took you to get this project, like it would have been a different project if you started at any time sooner because of all the community you had support around that. Do you feel that way too? Do you feel like the, it, the process to get to this kind of naturally happened for you? Can you talk um, a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. You know, I, I think it, it was a film that I, when I was ready to do it, um, that, that had to be the right time to do it. Yeah. Um, um, and then what was it? And cause T um, talk about the timing in pre-production. How long was pre-production for you? How long was that process before um, you started shooting? Actual, actual pre-production was about three or four months. Okay, and so it, it takes an independent film so many favors and so much timing around that, and you had a wonderful cast, and you there were busy working actors, and so was there any adjustments in making that happen, or did it, the puzzle just seem to naturally fit as it just kept going down through pre-production, or was there any kind of like, um, hiccups? You know, looking back, it, it was remarkably smooth. Um, you know, I've heard lots of horror stories, and luckily uh, I, didn't, I didn't experience any of them. We, when we got to shooting, when we get to it, there were a few uh, hiccups, but... Um, all through pre-production, we were it was went pretty <laughs> my production designer's laughing. It went pretty smoothly. Oh, and I found my production designer through another producer who said there's only one production designer you you have to use. And uh, I met Nico. She walked in, her arm was in a sling, and she had just gotten in a motorcycle accident. And she was wearing a leather jacket, and I thought, oh man, this chick's cool. But I had just had hip surgery, some hip surgery. So the two of us like, like hobbled over to my couch and sat down and we started talking and I fell in love with her instantly. And then she dropped a pen. And the two of us looked at each other and were like, there's no way either one of us is gonna be able to pick up this pen. Hopefully you have a good memory. So, I mean, that, was, that sort of solidified our relationship. <laughs> But she, I mean, she was 
remarkable and and all the all the artwork on Kayla's walls and all the um, drawings were by her art department head and she really created the the world that they lived in um, so you um, talked a little bit about financing you said you had some money um, initially what was that other process was it was it through just various connections of who to who did you do any crowdfunding kind of what was um, that I you? didn't do any crowdfunding okay. you know I I if uh, if I did another indie through this route I might I might do crowdfunding uh, but we just had some angels so um, but you know yeah Which it's another timing thing of you having that experience in your career to be able to have those people. Sounds right. like, yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, so let's talk a little bit about casting because we obviously have an um, audience of actors. Um, talk a little bit about that. So one, you had a wealth of community of actors to draw from, obviously. Yes, I did. So um, one of our directors from ER, Jonathan Kaplan, who's been one of my mentors, you know, he said, you know, I'll do bad imitation of him. He said, well, you got a bunch of youngsters and you got to you got to cast those people. But for the other parts, you got to use all your friends on ER cuz you know, you the, they'll keep your day going and they'll do one take and you know you can rely on them and and he was right. And I begged my friends who all I mean you you sort of saw them. They all showed up and were amazing. So I I felt like, you know, that I think that's one of the things with with indie films is that sometimes you see, you know, the, the leads are good and then you get the little parts, it's somebody's aunt or, you know, somebody's cousin and they're not actors and you can see it. And it makes everybody, they, they get in your film and then they stop because suddenly, you know, they're not watching actors, they're watching, they're watching, you know, non-actors and it interrupts the flow of your film. So, I mean, I would say in, you know, unless there's specific parts, if you can use real working actors and call on your friends when you're, when you're doing an indie, because, you know, you're not going to get, you're not going to get the caliber of actors that I had in my film for those roles um, at an, uh, you know, uh, at, at that level. Um, but as far as the casting of everybody else goes, um, I asked John Levy, the casting director for ER, to help me with the casting. And uh, we put out a call and breakdowns, just like everybody else does. And we got a, you know, we got a really great group of actors. We were very lucky. Um, but when I was casting Kayla, I kept looking at this picture of this girl and the casting director said, well, she's out of town and she, you know, she can't come until two days from now. And it was Nicole. And I kept saying, when is she coming in? <laughs> when is she coming in? And then she finally came in and I, my hands started to shake and my eyes started to tear. And all I could think of was, please, God, let her show up on the set on the first day. Just let her please, let her please get out of school. She was going to USC at the time. Let her please finish her papers and her finals so she can do this film. And it's one of those things where, you know, the actors who came in were all really great. Um, but, you know, Nicole walked in and she, she was just easy and free and open and at one point, one of the other actors, Delon, who played Trajan, said to her, when you say your lines, you just sound like you're talking, like you're just making up what you're saying. And it's true, you know, she, she has this quality that, you know, a lot of us spend many years trying to get, and she had it from the start. Um, Robert, JJ, you know, I had pictured sort of a, a Lenny Kravitz kind of kid, you know, sort of rich and maybe a little bit of a, you know, full of himself or whatever. And then Robert came in and he was all the things the character is and he said the lines exactly how I pictured the character saying them. 
but he didn't look like what I thought he, what I had, the picture of him I had in my head. But because he embodied the character and because he, 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 his, in his acting, he really had all the elements of who this, who this boy was, that it was like, you know, when you're looking at an audition tape and that one person comes in who really did his homework but also has that quality, their, their audition sort of pops up at you. And Robert, from the moment he came in, uh, I thought, okay, it doesn't matter what I thought the character was gonna look like, um, this is him. It, it reminds me of the old adage, it sounds for both of them, it, it was their job. They did all the work, but it kind of, when they came in, it was just such a natural fit that it was their job. Right. It, 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 the decision was almost made for them because it was just for you, it was so natural and everything. Yes, That's exactly. great. Um, let's talk a little bit about production. Um, how many days did you shoot? Did you have any rehearsals? Talk a little bit about that. Uh, we had rehearsals at my house. Each one of the actors would come over one at a time and uh, just go over their scenes and act with me and you know because a lot of the actors were younger um, I was trying to figure out how each one of them worked and how best to work with them um, with Delon I he was he's from New York and I and I just assumed I said y you have a driver's license right and you know <laughs> you ride a horse right <laughs> And what do we say when we go on an audition and somebody says, you ride a horse, right? You go, yeah. So I said, you drive a car, right? <laughs> yeah. So I said, so we got, we started rehearsing and I said, so you, you have a driver's license, right? He said, um, I, I have a permit <laughs> from New York. <laughs> yeah. So I said, can you drive? And he said, yeah. <laughs> So what we did was we got in my car and I let him drive and I said, let's rehearse, because most of his scenes were in the car. So he said, let's just rehearse this whole movie in the car with you driving. And I took my life into my own hands because he didn't stop at stop signs. He didn't put his turn signal on. He <laughs> was going, he was driving like this, 10 miles an hour. And we, I had to teach him how to drive. I had to teach him how to drive, and then, you know, then we started rehearsing the, the movie. Um, so, yeah, that's how we rehearsed. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you're still here and yeah. alive. <laughs> um, wow, that's the first time I've heard, ever heard that. <laughs> um, I'm shocked. Um, so then how many days did you actually shoot? How many we production days? We shot 18 days, days okay. uh, six, day, six days a week, 12 hours a day okay. under the ultra low budget yeah. SAG contract. Um, and then in that process, talk a little bit about locations. Where did you shoot? Um, there was an old boys reformatory in um, Whittier called Nell's, which is no longer there. Um, and it was used for filming uh, in the 80s, I guess. I mean, the bad thing is that, that the state decided that if you were a minor and you committed, because this was like a, a, a reformatory for boys who had committed, you know, bad crimes. And uh, in the 80s, the state of California decided that if, even if you were a minor, if you had committed one of those crimes, you had to go to a regular prison, a, an adult prison. So they closed this place down, and then it started being used for filming. So we shot all the prison scenes there. And then we thought, well, since we're here, let's look around Whittier and see if we can find um, a house. So a friend of uh, the, my publicist's daughter is a realtor in Whittier. So she tried to help us find a house that was for sale, that was sitting on the market for a while, that would, you know, that's just sitting there. Can we rent it for a week? And we'll give you a little pile of money, and you know, if it's just sitting there, why not make some money off it? And we found a house, that house that they shot in, we shot in, um, and uh, we found a liquor store, 
Um, I think that's, I think that's, and then the, we did it, we did some stuff on the streets of Whittier. Um, we also shot some stuff in East LA. And then of course we, we shot um, right near here, near the museum. Um, give us kind of some behind the scenes stories of the, some of the scenes. Did you know dog have to stop barking for five minutes to shoot something? Did you know avoid the police? Whatever the, your stories are. Um, all of the above. All of the above. <laughs> There's usually some. <laughs> Uh, the first day, we were in a cul-de-sac, and we didn't realize it was trash day. <laughs> so first, the big trash truck came to get the regular garbage. And we're like, great, we can start shooting. We were doing exteriors first day. Great, we can start shooting. Then the next truck came to get the recycling, and so we had to wait for that truck. And then we came, great, we can start shooting. And then the next truck came to get the, um, you know, the lawn clippings, and so it, it took a while to get those first uh, few shots on the first day, but we, we did it. And then the second day, the electricity in the house went out. So we, they were trying to you know, get a ge generator, and it, we were down for a couple of hours. And then the script supervisor said, why don't we just take the bikes out and try and shoot some of the girls on the bikes? So we did some of that, and we saved some of the day, and then we got a generator. and that worked out. And then we were shooting, um, oh, so we got shut down one day because we were shooting at a school and we got the bright idea to shoot at the school next door to see the kids coming out like the bell rang and the principal saw us and he was, he shut us down. He called the police and then we got shut down. So then we, um, Oh, then all the stuff in the car uh, was at night, you know, we had the two actors in the front and the DP and I sat in the back seat and they rigged this thing. Now, I remember Delon's driving. <laughs> we rigged this thing. It was this big, you know, reflector off the front of the car, but you couldn't see out the front. So he would have to like go like this to see past the edge of the reflector and we drove down the streets of Whittier like that, and we got stopped twice that night. <laughs> and the first time we got stopped, Delon was like, I don't have a driver's license. I can't, I don't know what to do. And I said, just sit there and don't say anything. So I jumped out of the car, and I said, hi, officer, is there a problem? <laughs> and he said, well, uh, you know, what's this thing you got in the front of your car? It looks like it's obstructing the view. <laughs> And I said, oh, really? Um, well, you know, I, I'm, and I pretended like I was a film student. You know, I, this is just for school, and, you know, we got this thing, and I'm really sorry I didn't realize that was, like, illegal or anything. He said, well, where are you going? And I said, just over there. We're just, we're, all our stuff's over there, all our stuff. And he goes, okay, well, just drive carefully over there and don't drive anymore. And I said, okay, thanks. And then we drove back over there and we waited for the cops to go away. And then we, of course, went back out. And then uh, we finished, so we finished those shots. And then we wanted a shot of the car. So we had a little mini van thing with a hatchback on the back. And um, the DP sat on the back of the thing like this with the camera. And the camera assistant and I held on to the back of his pants. And then uh, the two actors were in the car driving toward us. So we're driving down the street like this. And then in the monitor behind, the, behind uh, Treshawn's car, I see these red and blue lights go on. And I said, oh, no, the cops again. So we pull over, and they're like, Gee, you know, the Whittier police are the nicest police in the world. Gee, you know, that, that doesn't really look safe. And I said, no, no, we're holding the back of his pants. He's, he's not going to fall out. And, and they said, well, gosh, you know, I don't know if you, I can let you drive around like that anymore. I said, okay, well, you know, we, we'll, we'll, sh we'll shut the thing and we won't do it anymore. Sorry. He goes, okay. 
just, you know, don't fall out of the van. I said, okay, we won't. And then we waited till they left. And then we opened the thing and we finished shooting out the back of the van. Um, let's see what else happened. <laughs> Yeah, I like <laughs> you need to send them a thank you. <laughs> It'd have been ironic if it was the same policeman. That no, was, it wasn't. That's um, it wasn't. But they well, were very nice. I'm glad your crew was safe and that your equipment <laughs> made it as well. Um, did was there anything that you had to change? Did you plan a scene to go a certain way, and because of X, Y, and Z, you had to shoot it differently? And was there any of that kind of thing? Or did you still get all the shots that you were in the script as planned, as storyboarded, and all that kind of stuff? Um, yeah, I got, I got, not wood, I got everything I wanted. Um, the arrest scene, it was a bear to light. And so it took about three hours to light that scene. And by the time they got it, you know, we waited for the sun to come down, and they were having some problems. and. By the time we were ready to shoot, we had 20 minutes to shoot that scene. So I said, let's just do a series, which means you just keep the camera rolling because you've got tape. It's not like, you know, we weren't shooting on film. So you can just let the camera roll. And the, the benefit of that for, for actors is that you don't have that sort of gap between cut and action where you can, you know, sort of, it, it's sort of like, doing theater where you get to do your scenes all in a row. When you're doing a series, you get to do it again. And, okay, I can do it again. Okay, I can do it again. Um, so we just kept the camera rolling and we just did series of each shot. And I, at that point, I had this whole shot list of what I wanted. And because I had 20 minutes to shoot it, I thought, all right, I, I can do without this. I can do without this. What, what do I need to tell this story? And we, we just did the few shots that I want. I needed the master and then the few shots that I, that I needed. And crossed my fingers and I asked the editor to, to cut that shot, that, that scene that night. And uh, I called her in the morning. She said, cut's great. It's all here. So, you know, I mean, that, that's one of those things where, you know, I, Honestly, your your experience as a, an actor, you know, you you know how to tell a story. We we know how to tell stories. Most of us have come from theater where we're the boss. We're up here for an hour and a half. We get to control the story, we get to control the flow, we get to control the arc of 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 the the telling of of the piece. So when we become directors, um, I think we're already, you know, we already know how to tell a story. So a lot of this is innate in us, and it's just a matter of trusting that, that you can do it, because I know you can as an actor. You had a great um, segue there, because um, I was just going to ask about the editor. So, so it sounds like you had the editor there during the production to, to cut some things. Yes. To, so talk a little bit about how important that was during the, the filming process to have that editor there to, like you said, cut some things and see if you got everything and right. stuff like that. Talk about that process. Um, I, I met my editor uh, through uh, the post-production supervisor on the very first short I did, um, who I met through ER. And uh, she recommended uh, Meredith Summers, who, uh, at the time was an assistant editor, but you know, was just about ready to become an editor and I knew she could do this. So we met before I started shooting, we talked about the story, um, we talked a little bit about what she would need, but not a lot. And um, we delivered everything to her every night and she started assembling it right away so that she could see, you know, make sure we had what we needed, at least while we were shooting in one location, then I could go back and pick things up. But luckily, you know, she didn't see anything, there weren't any gaping holes. So um, it was really important to, to have her there, um, sort of, I knew that if she felt like it was cutting well, 
that we were going to do okay. Yeah. Great. Um, talk a little bit about the post-production process. Of, um, what was that like? Any things that you learned from it? Um, if, any advice you would have for anybody in that process? Because it can be a strenu strenuous process sometimes. Um, I loved it. I love post. Um, you know, we edited for, we didn't really edit that long, probably a couple of months. Um, and then I went and did the sound and the music. And I think the most important thing I learned was once I had the music and the sound on there, uh, we did a screening on a big screen so we could look at it. And we did a lot of adjustments because when you're looking at a little tiny screen, you know, your eye only has to go like this. But when you're looking at a big screen like this, by the time your eye goes from here to here, if you've cut out of that shot, it, you haven't had a chance to see what's over here. So we, we did some re-editing. And then the music, you know, we could tell we lifted out a lot of pieces because once you saw it on the big screen, we saw that it wasn't necessary to have as many, um, you know, spots of music. Um, that that was a huge lesson for me to to just screen it. I had gone to um, AFI; it was part of the directing workshop for women, and they've been tremendously supportive of me through the years. Um, so they allowed me to use one of their screening rooms to look at it, and uh, and you know wh wherever you can wherever you can go to to look at it on a big screen before you do your final uh, cut, I would say it's really important to do. A um, couple more questions. Um, I'm curious. You started doing some directing some short films, and this is the, the first feature. What was that learning process? or gap for you from going to short film to feature film that you're like, okay, this is what I learned in the short film process and this is what then you kind of learned in the feature film process. Was there anything that was a difference for you? Um, you know, for short films, what I learned in the directing workshop for women, which was a real, um, you know, a really important part of, of the workshop, was learning how to structure a short film because you're telling a story really quickly and you always have to sort of have a little punch at the end. But with long form, you know, you don't, you don't have to do that. You can tell your story in a, a, a longer form. Um, but you still have to have, you know, an arc. Everybody has to have an arc. Everybody has to have a, you know, a, like an exciting, plot point happening, plots point, plot points happening, you know, I mean, it, the, there's just a different structure to it. Um, and frankly, you know, I, um, I was trying to get hired as a director and making short films to do that. Um, but everybody kept saying, well, yeah, your short film's good, but do you have a feature? So finally I was like, okay, fine. Here's your feature. And, um, you know, my feature got me into the ABC Creative Development Program, which, um, you know, helped me get my first DGA job directing Nashville this month. Congrats. <laughs> yeah. Clap that out. So we always like to wrap up in kind of like a, the golden nugget question mm -hmm. for, um, for anyone who's looking to do a short or maybe transitioning from short into features would be one or two kind of like if they didn't remember anything else, you would encourage them to remember this as they go through that process. Um, I I would say you know I, I I would assume that you're trying to go to festivals, that you're trying to get distribution, that you're trying to you know you, we're we're not making films in a vacuum. Um, we want people to see them. So uh, I would say, I, I guess, well, I guess there's a couple of things I would say. Um, if you're looking toward festivals, you know, don't worry if you don't get into the big ones, the Sundance, the Tellurides. Um, both my first short and this feature didn't 
I mean, it got into a few really big ones, Hawaii, um, but most of the ac all the accolades came from uh, s smaller festivals, and uh, I still got a lot of uh, online distribution, you know, and uh, it, it still got a life on Amazon and all these other indie rain, Tubby TV. Uh, snag film. It was on Hulu for a long time. Um, I would say, you know, if you're if you're just trying to make a film to get into a festival, it, it, that's not the way to make your film, because it's such a long process, and because you're asking people to help you in a way that, you know, you're not making a three hundred million dollar film. People aren't going to make a you know, boatloads of money, they're doing it for love. So if, if you're not doing it for love, they're going to feel it. It has to be a project that you have passion for. And that's how you get people to come on board. Um, and, you know, I, I hope you have fun, because I, I didn't know I was going to enjoy this as much as I do. And... Uh, Directing is really just another part of storytelling. And as actors, that's what we do. And, um, you know, I encourage you to make your own films. You know, you can do it on an iPhone now. Post it on YouTube. You know, you can make, you can make little films. Um, Nicole's made a couple little, tiny little films that she's posted. And they're fantastic. You know, it's, it's a way to be creative. It's a way to keep your muscles exercised. And it's, it's just a way to keep telling stories. Great. I think that's a great place to end. Thank you, Lily. Let's give her a hand. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you.